Welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's December 4th, 2017, and we are continuing our uh, very interesting series on uh, the Denver Snuffer Movement or the Christ Restoration Movement, or I don't know what to call it. I don't think they do either. But last week we interviewed Kirk and Karen Strong, epic kind of four, five, six hour interview. I, I don't even know yet how long it was. But it was fascinating to hear Karen and Kirk Strong um, talk about how uh, Kirk taught uh, Book of Mormon at BYU for 15 years, was in charge of admissions for BYU, served on like four bishoprics, um, and how he and his wife, as active devout members of the church, started feeling like the church was going into apostasy in the mid-1990s, and uh, were already uh, primed and ready saw the church becoming too liberal or too progressive from their perspective. And then when they discovered Denver Snuffer's books and writings, um, led them into the movement. So uh, it's a great interview. You'll want to listen to that first before you listen to this one, if you can, uh, because it uh, we covered a lot of stuff there that we won't try and repeat here, although we may do some repetition. But they're just, they're just an amazing couple, really honest and down to earth, thoughtful and passionate. And uh, it's a great interview. So uh, to follow um, today, we're going to be interviewing Matt Lohmeyer. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about any of this, a few years ago, I interviewed Denver Snuffer. Uh, Denver Snuffer uh, was a convert to the LDS Church, uh, attended BYU Law School, served uh, in his stake in Sandy for many years, including on the State High Council, um, but started writing books uh, and blogging about uh, sort of, I'll say fundamentalist Mormonism with an asterisk. It wasn't, uh, you know, polygamist Mormonism, but it's basically paying super close attention to the Book of Mormon, super close attention to the Doctrine and Covenants, to the words of Joseph Smith, and basing your devotion to the gospel on those writings primarily, with a special emphasis on um on developing your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And some like to emphasize this idea of having a personal witness or visitation from Jesus. Some might call that having your calling election made sure or the second comforter. I don't know the exact terms to use, but uh, Denver Snuffer was ultimately excommunicated in September of 2013 uh, for his books. Um, and, and, he continued, his movement continued to grow. There are now thousands of followers. They have uh, you know, developed their own scripture that they're releasing soon. They're having conferences. They have house meetings or cottage meetings on Sundays. Uh, and they're even, as we learned with Kirk and Karen Strong, uh, they are even um, waiting for the new location for the new Jerusalem for Zion and the date when the saints are to gather. And they're building a temple, uh, or at least they're raising the money to build a temple. So all sorts of interesting stuff uh, that is worth paying attention to. Now, why are we interviewing Matt Lomar? Well, I've never met Matt until today, uh, but Matt and his wife, uh, Sarah, are interesting for a number of reasons. So Matt uh, joined the church as a convert uh, when he was uh, a teenager. He ended up... Uh, he ended up attending the U.S. Air Force Academy and flying F-15s, mm -hmm. uh, which is cool. Um, he also married uh, Sarah McConkie, who is the daughter of Mark McConkie and the granddaughter of Bruce R. McConkie. Bruce R. McConkie was a Mormon apostle who kind of dominated Mormon thought for three, four decades uh, until recently. And so I'm just going to tell two uh, personal stories at the introduction. And I do want to ask listeners, I want to thank all our listeners for joining us today on Mormon Stories. And I want to encourage them to please let us know if the audio isn't good. Uh, we've got some audio. We've got, I've got a technician here helping me. And if the audio is not good, we want to know that. Um, but I'm going to tell two quick stories to introduce this episode. So... Uh, after I left Microsoft in 2004, I went to Utah State University. And while I was at Utah State University, I met uh, a young man named Mark McConkie. And Mark McConkie 
is the nicest, most gentle, humble, but thoughtful and wise. So, you know, one of the most wise and thoughtful young people I've met in a long time. And <clears throat> Mark, of course, I noticed the name. We were both getting our PhDs at the time in instructional technology. And of course, I noticed the name. So uh, Mark and I became fast friends. And Mark McConkey and I became friends right when I started Mormon Stories. He was someone that I talked to a lot about it. And we had these early, very doctrinal conversations. There were two conversations that I'll never forget with Mark McConkie. The first was when he said, I was, you know, telling him about my impression of Mormon doctrine and Bruce R. McConkie and all these teachings uh, that had since uh, maybe been distanced from by the church. And I had interviewed Greg Prince as my very first Mormon Stories interview, and I had just read uh, David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism. And in that book, he makes it clear that the book Mormon Doctrine was not loved and appreciated uh, by all the brethren. Uh, and of course, he chronicles how eventually um, David O. McKay and, and Bruce O. McConkie actually had differences. Um, and, and the original Mormon Doctrine edition had to be changed multiple times uh, because the brethren weren't comfortable with a lot of things about it. Anyway, one conversation I'll never forget is when Mark McConkie told me, just because uh, Bruce, uh, Apostle McConkie, took things out of Mormon Doctrine, doesn't mean that those things were untrue or that, that the brethren didn't believe them. They were removed because maybe they weren't popular or, uh, you know, they were uncomfortable for some. Um, but he, he definitely gave me the impression that both, whatever Bruce R. McConkie took out of the book, it wasn't because he stopped believing those things. It was because for practical reasons, they had to be removed from the book. So that was one interesting thing that I heard. The second thing that Mark said to me, and I'll never forget it, was how proud he was. He said to me, John, uh, not one child or grandchild of any of Bruce R. McConkie's posterity has ever left the church. And he said that to me with sort of this pride. Um, and this is in 2006, 2007, I'm guessing. Um, and I was really stunned by that. I thought certainly some of Bruce R. McConkie's posterity are gay, and certainly some of them are apostates or don't believe anymore because every family's got it. Like 40% of, of people raised in the LDS church in the US leave and and so anyway that's what was so interesting to me about this interview first and foremost because what i found out is that matt lohmeyer ended up um marrying sarah mcconkey uh sarah for, for those of you who are mormon stories listeners sarah was the institute or seminary teacher uh sorry the institute or seminary student of john mcclay so if any of you remember my interview with john and brooke mcclay uh, Sarah was a student of John's at some point, and we'll probably learn a little bit about that. Um, so that's another connection we have. But Sarah and Matt eventually got married, got married in the temple, and they were devout members of the church for, for many, many years. But um, at some point, they learned about uh, Denver Snuffer, his books, his writings, and his teachings. And that led to them becoming believers or followers in the, Bruce, in the Denver Snuffer sort of teachings, and ultimately they were excommunicated in July, July 2015. of 2015, which was a few months after I was excommunicated. So, um, so and you will, you will find very interesting the letter that Matt wrote uh, to his stake president, um, because it's really interesting, and I read it this morning, and he makes a really compelling case that the modern LDS church is in apostasy. And he even uses the term antichrist. And that's surprising because that's such a loaded term. And Matt's not a guy that I'm gonna assume just throws around loaded language. He works for the Air Force today. Um, he's, I think, I do. he's very deliberate in his language and in his speech, he's very thoughtful. But he uses the term antichrist to describe the modern LDS apostles because they're teaching principles that, that are not putting Christ at the center. Um, so we'll be sharing the letter that he wrote to a stake president. We're gonna be going through it. And we're gonna talk about not only his interactions with his stake president that led to the excommunication, 
We're also going to talk about the current status of the movement, and we're going to talk about the McConkie family and what their interactions with the McConkie family has been like. Because Mark McConkie, Sarah's dad, is sort of like the remaining eldest member of the McConkie children because Joseph Fielding Smith has passed away. So we're going to get a get an understanding of what this is like for the McConkie family as well. I think that's the longest introduction I've ever done for a Mormon Stories interview, but I'm excited. Thanks, John. So Matt Lomar, welcome to Mormon Stories. Thank you very much. And shout out to Sarah. Sarah, thanks for joining us as well. We, we're, we're grateful uh, that you're letting us kind of tell the story, although Matt's not going to speak for you, and we'll be talking about that as well. So Matt, I gave that long Thank introduction. You. What disclaimers do you want to start with? Or corrections, you can correct the record. No, I won't correct anything that you said. Um, I think, uh, and it was Joseph Fielding McConkie. What did uh, I say? You said Joseph Fielding Smith. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, but yeah, Joseph yeah, Fielding thank you. Uh, McConkie was the oldest uh, surviving of the McConkie, Bruce's children. But uh, Mark, um, yeah, Mark is Sarah's father, lives in Colorado Springs with us. Okay, um, so is there anything you want to correct about the record of the things I uh, things I said? Real quick. Uh, uh, just one thing I would say in reference to the Antichrist uh, comment. Uh, I'm hoping that as a part of the uh, the podcast link or the page on which the interview is going to show up, you'll have a link to the letter um, so that the readers or the listeners can read that letter and, and view the context of, of the statement. I 100% uh, so will include that, that yeah. Yep. And that's it. No, no corrections. Okay, um, so um, I want to thank all our listeners on Facebook Live. We hope that you will post comments and questions. This will be a long interview. We know we have to end at four, um, but we're going to go the full day, and um, we will break for lunch also to recharge my iPhone because it runs out of batteries. Um, but we want to encourage you to make comments and questions on the Facebook feed uh, because we'll incorporate them, and that makes... Uh, what we're doing kind of more interactive. So, so let's launch in. Matt, why don't right. you tell us about your, your conversion to the church? Sure. Let's start there. Yeah, I converted to the church in high school, like you'd mentioned. I was at a Catholic high school. Uh, I was a freshman at a Catholic high school, and I had been going to both the LDS church uh, for some time, probably at least many months, with my mom, who had recently um, come back into activity in the church. And I was also on Sundays uh, occasionally going to the Catholic Church with my father and sometimes my grandparents on my father's side. Uh, the oldest of four kids, all four of us kids were going to both churches. And uh, my mom was making the uh, decision that it was an important point in her life to start uh, being active again in the Mormon Church. And she felt compelled to bring her children with her to the Mormon Church. So we got to experience both the Catholic and Mormon churches. Uh, I wasn't the first to be baptized of my siblings. I had a younger brother and a younger sister who were baptized first. And I took the missionary discussions over and over again uh, from different sets of missionaries uh, saying that I would read the Book of Mormon or do the praying and do the readings and never did uh, until uh, my freshman year at, at this Catholic high school in Tucson, Arizona. And that's when I had um, had enough contact with the message that the missionaries were teaching, that uh, I decided it was a good decision for me to be baptized into the LDS Church. That was not because I had had converting experiences to the gospel at that point. That was because I had a general sense that that was a, a good decision for me and a good path for me to take. And one recollection that I have that I need to mention now um, that, that was actually... Um, important to me, although I didn't remember it until later in my life, several years before I started to meet with the missionaries, um, I remember my mom bringing in a book from the alley in the back of our house. And the, the garbage man um, would drive down the alleys in between the homes, and that's where the big trash cans were located. And she had, she's five foot three, and I'm guessing that trash can is five foot three at least, and so she had to probably dump or tip this trash can over. And uh, she had seen when she was out throwing trash in the trash can uh, a blue book of Mormon down in there that the missionaries had apparently given to our neighbors across the alley, uh, the, the, the typical blue book of Mormon with the gold lettering. And she had tipped that trash can over, pulled the book of Mormon out, brought it into the house, and dusted it off. And I didn't know what the book was. And uh, I asked her what she was doing, and she said, that book does not belong in the trash can. 
This is my inactive mother. She had not started going back to church. But it tells you that in spite of her having left the church and left activity, there was a lingering testimony of the gospel that, that was in her. And that would eventually turn into her being persuaded by visiting teachers to go back into activity in the church. And that led to me and my uh, my brother and two sisters all eventually being baptized into the church. And for me, that was in high school at a Catholic high school. Okay, so you say when you converted, it wasn't at first because you had some witness. Right. It was just, it felt like the right thing to do. Yeah, in fact, the, 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 the missionary who finally baptized me was a lacrosse player at BYU, and he was cool. <laughs> and he basically, one Sunday morning, it was his last day on his mission. Uh, in fact, uh, I've recently been in touch with this um, former elder. Uh, I think he's since left the church. Um, but I, I was basically put up against the wall in the chapel. And he says, listen here, I know you believe this stuff. Uh, I was 14 years old at the time. Uh, that was, that was um, December 4th of 1996. That was 21 years ago today. And he says, this is my last day on my mission, and I'm going to baptize you before I go home. So basically, go inform the word that you're being baptized. And I was convinced. I said, yeah, that's the right decision. So I, I left church. My dad wasn't there. He was at home. Uh, I remember walking into the bedroom where my dad was laying down, and I think watching television, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I said, Dad, I'm getting baptized into the Mormon church. And that was a very difficult, um, that was difficult news to bear to my father. And um, he was quiet. He, uh, got, Why didn't he like it? Well, he, he had been raised Catholic, and he had been um, potentially raised anti-Mormon, but had certainly become anti-Mormon at this point. And that will play into the story here in just a little bit. But um, um, So he, he was displeased, I think, that I was cho choosing as the oldest of his children to join the LDS church. He got dressed. He came to the chapel, and later that afternoon, the ward put together a Herculean effort to have a good showing to support this recently activated Lohmeyer family, a part member family, as they call it. And I had a nice baptismal service. I don't remember anything about it other than that my father came. That meant the world to me. Um, and you were how old again? Uh, that was two days before my 15th birthday. Okay. And then I went back to Catholic <coughs> school the next day and took Catholic classes and was one of, as I recall, two... Um, active Latter-day Saints at that Catholic private high school. And I had, that only lasted for the rest of that year, and then I, I left the Catholic school my sophomore year and went and joined a public school um, and actually played basketball at this public school for the same coach that my father had played for at that same high school 20 years earlier. And In fact, when my dad was my age now, I was playing high school basketball. Um, but uh, that's that's when I joined the church, um, and, and like you've pointed out, uh, and not like I said, I wasn't converted to the gospel. Uh, that was a couple of years later, uh, and I continue to live my life how I had, kind of sort of believing, and being active in the Mormon church, going to seminary at, at, at a release time seminary class, and in between my junior and senior year of high school is when I um, had some experiences that were converting for me. Well, talk about those. Um, and I, I want to, to point out, so as I get to this converting experience, um, I remember my dad and my mom, I asked them for permission to share this, having arguments in the home over religion. Uh, that's hard for any child. It doesn't matter what the topic is. Religion is particularly poignant in some ways, especially when you've just chosen to be baptized into a church over which your parents are arguing. And so being in a mixed faith home, as it were, and hearing arguments taking place, a child, uh, I can't speak for the other siblings, but a child can't help but wonder um, how their decisions have impacted the relationship of their parents. Um, but what also angered me was that I trusted that my mom had a, um, I trusted that she had evidence for her belief in the Mormon faith and that my dad was attacking her religion and her beliefs based on a stupid book he had next to his bed on the nightstand that was called The Kingdom of the Cults. That was my thinking at the time and I'm in high school. And I was angry about that. And so when my dad was at work and my mom wasn't looking because she wouldn't have condoned me going to look at this book, I'm sure I went and found that book and I brought it back to my bedroom. 
And I remember, uh, this is me, unconverted me, sitting in my bedroom, uh, feeling like I'm sneaking something very sinful into my room. And I, I flipped to the Mormon uh, sec- the Mormonism section in the Kingdom of the Cults. And, and I read, I don't know how many pages that, I, I haven't looked in a long time, 30, 40, 50 pages I read through of, um, of what I had considered anti-Mormon literature about my faith that I had just been baptized into. And it was one of the darkest days to think, I think these guys are telling the truth, and yet it's a, it's a direct attack on my religion. And so that's one data point, if you will, um, that was kind of, it was compelling to me because I wanted to, I wanted to prove that my dad's arguments were wrong, and I couldn't do that unless I started to learn about Mormon history and actually figured out if my religion was true. Uh, at the same time, um, I had a, a wonderful teacher's quorum uh, advisor who was teaching the gospel in a way that actually made sense to me and, and that drew me in. And I was annoyed with and frustrated with other teachers in the teacher's quorum who se- seemed to not want to pay attention to what this man was saying. And I'm still friends with him. Um, he lives in Bountiful, in fact, with his wife. They're an older couple. Um, he was teaching the gospel in a way that was compelling to me. And so between the mix of emotions between having arguments in the home of religion, having been exposed to anti-Mormonism, and knowing that there's some issues with Mormon history, And the fact that I was beginning to be concerned with my standing before God and whether or not I was doing the right things in life, um, I ultimately was led, and I'll say by the Spirit, to be concerned enough about my standing to go make it a matter of prayer. And um, it was probably between, I think it was between my junior and senior years, um, I had the question planted in my mind that I'm going to ask God if Joseph Smith is a prophet. And I've not read the Book of Mormon before. I I don't know anything about his life. But that was the question that was pressing upon me. And I thought, because it hinges upon this. And at least that's what I've been taught in church. It hinges upon this this man. And um, I remember making a very humble attempt and kneeling next to my bed. uh, And I can picture the setting and and asking God verbally, uh, is Joseph Smith a true prophet, and uh, received an answer. Um, And it was the first time I can remember in my life having had a sure, clear answer come to me. What did it feel like? Um, I can describe the feeling that accompanied the knowledge. What was the knowledge and then what was the feeling? Thank you. Um, It was the the best way to describe the experience, um, and it's easy in retrospect to describe the experience for sure, it was clarity. And it was peace. Uh, th- and that's the feeling that accompanied the knowledge. But the, the clarity that came, um, in fact, was um, potentially akin to what some have described as being baptized by fire. Uh, I, I knew that the man about whom I was asking was sent by God as a servant and was a true prophet. And I had um, a complete change of heart that, that uh, was born of a feeling that washed over me from head to toe. Um, and that changed my life. Uh, and so, uh, without be getting too emotional about it. Um, what were you like that, as a high school kid? Uh, I would say <laughs> I was a little bit rotten. My parents would say I was very good. Um, and, and I think overall, in retrospect, as I look at kids, I was a pretty good kid. Uh, I had a foul mouth on the basketball court. Um, I, I, was, I liked to get into trouble. I had friends on the basketball team, and we liked to go out egging people's cars and houses and that, you know, just kind of rotten stuff. Were you but, a jock? Kind of and I was a jock, stereotypical yeah. jock? I was. Um, Did you but, like but academics? I was a good kid. Did you like? No, I was bored by uh, academics. Okay. Uh, I, was, I didn't like to read. In fact, I remember uh, my mom trying to get me to read uh, anything, and it was where the red fern grows. <laughs> and she would lock me in my bedroom. She says, you will stay in there, and you will read this chapter. And then I'd stay in there for half an hour doing whatever it was. And then I'd come out and she'd say, did you read the chapter? And I'd say, yep, I did. And she'd say, no, you didn't. You're lying because you'd be crying if you read the chapter I (laughs) told you to read. And um, so I never liked to read. But that experience that I had where I knew that Joseph was a prophet, it it fundamentally changed my trajectory because I knew that I needed to change my life, my actions. I really thought I probably should stop swearing, you know, those kinds of things, small stuff. 
I wanted to start reading the Book of Mormon. And so I started to read the Book of Mormon. And, and in the process of reading the Book of Mormon, gained a testimony of the Book of Mormon. And so that's kind of where my spiritual journey begins. It's between my junior and senior year of high school. As I'm called as the seminary president. Right after I have that, that experience and I'm converted, now I'm uh, in a leadership position, if you will, in high school, where I'm able to actually prepare and pr teach remarks and be concerned about the welfare of others. And that was all good for me, developmentally. Um, but, but this was in Tucson? This was in Tucson. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just, just as I'm kind of um, analyzing this a little bit, yeah. um, whether you look at it as someone being humbled uh, and prepared for the gospel or vulnerable, mm -hmm. like depending on your perspective, yep. but this, this fits a profile of someone who's, um, who's seeking because you, your parents were in conflict about religion. That must have been distressing to you. Honestly, it's the same type of stuff that distressed Joseph Smith because his parents were differing about religion, right? So there's some turmoil in the home, and you're f probably not feeling like you're being the best person you can be, probably feeling like you're maybe a little bit lost. or And so you, your heart was kind of ready for that witness. Is that, is that what you think? Yeah, that's accurate. And, and there's, this gets into um, a, another vital experience that I had uh, that kind of changed my trajectory a little bit. Um, I, I think uh, without, uh, I know you run the risk of talking too much about yourself, but this is an interview about me, so I'm going to talk is. about myself yeah, a little it bit. Is. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I've been given a gift to believe, and I think I've been given a gift to seek. Um, I, um, that, that teacher's quorum advisor that I had mentioned to you, um, he was constantly teaching in a way from the scriptures that was so compelling that I wanted to believe in the gospel. I found myself in high school going to his house. I say his house. It was their house. They were a couple who unitedly both understood Mormon doctrine, not the book, the, the idea of Mormon doctrine, Mormon history. And every time I sat down and met with them, I was... I was convinced these are people I can come to to ask questions that I have about the gospel, whatever they are. They will sit and open the scriptures with me, and they'll teach me from the scriptures what the answer to my question is. And that just blew me away because I was not getting that from friends. I was not getting that um, in church. But they did it well, and I would go to their house, and I would ask them my questions. They would teach me. I remember getting on a, in a minivan or a suburban. Like, it was spacious enough to be either, and we're driving to the Mesa Temple. <clears throat> and there was another brother in the ward who happened to home teach this family that was my teacher's quorum advisor. He was in the front seat with another brother who I think was in the bishopric. And they were talking about making or calling an election sure. I was probably 15 years old. Six, I, was, I was maybe 16 what years year old. What year about would this have been? This is probably, um, <clears throat> I think this is 96, 97. Okay. Um, I'm, a, I'm a sophomore in uh, I think it's probably 96, 97. Okay. That, that's my best recollection. Okay. I'm sitting in a bucket seat closest to the front of the car, and I'm listening to words that I've never heard before mentioned in church, never read about before. And meanwhile, there's my peers around me tickling one another. And I mean, this is, uh, this is making light of the situation, but it really frustrated me that I'm trying to listen to this conversation about something that seemed like they were trying to whisper about. And they were talking about the ceiling room and the temple, and there's a special place, and I'm listening, and I'm thinking, okay, we're not going to see any of that stuff today. I'm going to get baptized for the dead. I really wish these kids would be quiet because I, I'm really interested in the conversation. And so I butt in, and I say, hey, what are you talking about? What's calling an election? And this brother, um, I, I should, probably should, shouldn't mention names, but this brother said, um, that's something we don't talk about. And that was the end of it. And boy, did that pique my interest. <laughs> you want to tell me? I mean, this is, this is in fact, taking place. Don't look in place. the closet. Don't look in the closet. If I can recall, this is before I had the experience where I'm praying about Joseph Smith and getting converted to the gospel that is Mormonism. But, yeah, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> that really piqued my interest. And so you mix that with I'm being exposed to anti-Mormonism. I want to prove that my religion is true. 
I'm being exposed to the idea that there is something about making your calling and election sure. And, and that's all a backdrop. I don't investigate it at that time, but that's a backdrop for the seeking that then happens. And when I'm converted, that, that change of trajectory for me means I'm going to start buying as many books as I can about Mormon history, and I'm going to start researching. And um, in fact, I think I had, I've teased with others, I had a disease. I would buy 10 books, read one or two, and I'd buy 10 or 15 more, and I'd read one or two, and until I acquired hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. And would and have read hundreds of books about Mormon history and about you have I have and, and I don't think there was any issue over time, whether it was polygamy or anything else, CES letter stuff. We'll talk about maybe some of that later. There was nothing that I was going to encounter after a decade of being at this that that was going to be surprising to me. So, and, real quick, yeah, were you was the reason you were so interested in this idea of a calling election made sure because you were feeling guilt and shame for being unworthy or unrighteous or, you know, a rough kid? I don't think so. Because um, that would explain your interest in calling election made sure. It's like, how do I make sure I get to heaven, right? Yeah, there was something born in me when I heard the gospel preached. And as I started to read these books uh, and learned about the early church and about what they were talking about, and then I read teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and heard him talking about it, and he references John chapter 14, about how this is available to people in this life. This meaning? This experience of, of seeing God face to face, of having, of receiving what Joseph calls in the teachings, the second comforter. This is me in high school, senior year in high school, learning about these things and, and feeling absolutely convinced that this is something I must be searching for. Uh, and it had nothing to do with what I was learning at church. It had everything to do with studying Joseph's words. Uh, there was a couple of other books that I'll mention that were fundamental to me, and they're simple things, but what they were things that I had read that were fundamental game changers for me. One was a simple book ca called To Draw Nearer to God by Henry B. Eyring. And the premise of the book was, you need to not be afraid to listen to the Holy Ghost and ask God what it is you need to change, what it is you need to do. And when he speaks to you, you need to be brave enough to do it. That was so hard for me. And I thought, okay, I'll do it. And so I started, and then I'd go and I'd get on my knees and I'd say, God, what do you want me to do? Because I'm seeking for these experiences that I'm reading about in Scripture, that I'm seeing in these books. Um, approaching Zion by Hugh Nibley. That was a life changer for me. Um, the fact that I shouldn't be seeking for riches, but that I should be seeking for the kingdom of God. The, and then I start to read Mormon doctrine, and I start to read Bruce McConkie's writings and Joseph Fielding Smith's writings. I had a great seminary teacher. I went to him and I said, I'm interested in seeking for this, and you seem to know the gospel. Tell me what it is I should be reading. And to my seminary teacher's credit, he said, go buy the lectures on faith and read those. They're great. He says, read one at a time and take your time to think about it. He said, go buy Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph Fielding Smith and Volumes read that. Volumes 1, three, 2, and one, 3. three. <laughs> and so I bought them, and I read them. And he says, and read Bruce R. McConkie's writings. And I said, got it. And so I started reading, and I read it, and I read it, until I was convinced that these teachings about seeking for the face of God were, were true teachings, and they were actually the most compelling part or an aspect of the gospel to me. And that was my drive. So I have to ask you about that. Yeah. So there are all sorts of elements to the gospel. <clears throat> There's faith, repentance, baptism. There's the Holy Ghost, there's learning, there's service, there's charity, there's missionary work, there's temple work. Like, for, for a Mormon, there are a thousand things. There's journal writing, there's genealogy, right? There's so many things, family history, that, that you can think about in the gospel. Mm -hmm. Why, for you, was seeking the face of Christ, why was that the thing? Yeah, when there were a thousand other things. There are a thousand other things you could think about. And, and in sharing what I have, I, I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that I was not disinterested in those other things. In fact, I tried to muster interest in genealogy, for instance, and it, I never I've actually got there. I tried to be interested in all of those many other things that, um, that you mentioned. And I was interested in all that. I was interested in being a gospel student and a gospel scholar. I admired how Bruce McConkie knew the scriptures better than anyone else that I was reading, and so I wanted to be that, and I started memorizing scriptures. Um, and, 
and so for whatever reason there there was um there was a drive to accomplish what I felt like was an ultimate mission in this life, which is to be redeemed from the fall, which means you're brought back into the presence of God while you're in the flesh. And and um, I was nevertheless um, interested in all of those other things. So it wasn't an, what some might view as an unhealthy exclusion of the other tenets of the gospel and solely focusing on maybe what um, would be called a hobby horse. Uh, but but that was my underlying drive of everything that I was doing. If I need to figure out how to do that, I need to learn how to be charitable. I need to learn how to serve others because that's who Christ is. And I think that, um, so so I wasn't neglecting those other things. Okay. But I, I'll tell you what I was most interested in was Mormon history. Uh, and it stemmed from those early conversations and arguments in my home where um, it seemed that those discussions and arguments were based on Mormon history. And I wanted to get to the bottom of those issues and see if there was legitimacy to the claims of the anti-Mormons. I guess tension in your home, intellectual <clears throat> tension, knowledge-based tension would would drive you to want to resolve that tension. Like what's true? Like to you the yeah, stakes were really true? high. There's conflict in your home. So like figuring out what's true is sort of almost your way of resolving that conflict, at least for you. Yeah, and, and some of it was pride. Uh, I'll admit some of it was pride. I wanted to have the answers to shut down the the anti-arguments. Um, what I became surprised at as I studied Mormon history was that, hey, you know, their best arguments are based in truth. They don't take false made-up things and start writing anti-Mormon books to convince people they need to leave the Mormon church. They take historic, They take quotes from leaders of the church. They take historical vignettes, and and they use those to tell the story. Because when when a Mormon is encountering those true stories, and true quotes, and they discover that they're actually, in fact, telling the truth about what happened, that is their best ammunition to get people to be leaving the church or to lose their faith. And so I thought, I'm not willing to lose my faith because I've had God tell me that Joseph is a prophet. And that's not going to change, at least in the time being. I thought, that is not going to change. That is a truth. And I was able to hang my head on that, and it never has changed. And so with that solid foundation of knowledge, I was able to confront any of the scary things from church history that antis were talking about and think, they've explained how they are able to piece together those vignettes, but there's got to be a different way of looking at what has taken place. And so my labor for a decade, and it continues through college at the Air Force Academy, and it continues on my mission, and it continues after my mission and into my married life, was to d discover how it is I weave together a narrative of church history that makes sense of all the things that have taken place. That was a difficult task. It didn't mean I was swayed by some of the things I was hearing, but it was, it was to me, there's too many gaps in the fabric. Uh, and w with the traditional narrative of church history that the church was teaching me, I couldn't, I couldn't piece everything together, but I was getting close. Um, and so if you, don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to share another experience please that. so I, I was I'm gonna tweak your microphone keep talking don't stop please just keep talking um, I'm I'm recruited to play basketball at the Air Force Academy that's how I get into the Air Force Academy um, I no, you're good. You're okay you're I, I go there um, I'm, I'm still disinterested in academics I'm interested in studying the gospel. I would buy books, and they'd come in the mailroom, and I'd run down to the mailroom, and I'd get them, and as soon as I was done with class, I'd go back to my room, and I'd sit in my room for six hours, and I'd read about church history. And then I'd hope to get my homework done first thing in the morning before I went off to class. I mean, that's kind of what my, my rhythm was at the Air Force Academy. And um, I remember um, feeling, uh, this is before I ever went to the temple to be endowed before I left on my mission, which was in between my sophomore and junior years at the academy. I had gotten to a point where I thought, I've learned everything I can learn from these books, and there's nothing else I can learn in church. The only way I can continue to progress in knowledge and in truth and in light is to actually meet Christ and to have him continue to teach me. And so um, I remember waiting for the school week to be over one week. Uh, so that I could go hike the mountain behind the Air Force Academy. It's a beautiful setting. And I remember going up this hill and uh, and kneeling down and praying and, and asking God 
um, if he would uh, reveal himself to me. Pre-mission or post-mission? Pre-mission. Okay. Um, so you're 18, 19? I'm, I'm probably 19 okay. at this time. Uh, again, not yet been through the temple, don't know what that's all about. Uh, and, and I knew that was sensitive enough that I'm not willing to Google that stuff. And, you know, but so I'm praying and asking, and I'm fully expecting uh, to ha have that prayer answered. And I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and nothing happens. And, and I even hear a little bit of a rustling in the bushes, which was probably a bird. And I'm picturing, <laughs> like, first vision account and Satan. Satan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm expecting to happen. Um, and I am fully anticipating that I'm going to meet an angel or meet the Lord. And I don't know if in my life I've ever approached the Lord with as much faith. Um, that, that, that moment was peculiar. I, I really felt a connection to the heavens. And so there I am waiting for the veil to part and for things to happen, and it doesn't. And um, I jog back down the hill, and I go to my bedroom. And I needed, I had a roommate at the time, and I couldn't sit and weep in my bedroom. So I go down the end of the hallway there at the Air Force Academy in my squadron. There's a phone room where they had pay phones where you could call your parents on the weekends. And I went and I locked the door in the phone room, and I wept, and I wept, and I, I pled with the Lord. And I said, you know I had the faith. And... Um, I felt like I had the assurance that I was going to receive according to my desires. And um, the thought came to me that you need to read your scriptures, and I did, and I opened up to section 67 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Lord spoke very clearly to me uh, in that section. And, um, if you, and I can read what it said uh, as a response from the Lord to me about why I didn't obtain the uh, the answer if, do if you don't mind um because and the reason i share this it's an People important people don't always pull out their this scriptures is, on mormon stories podcast this is good then you need more scriptures on <laughs> on mormon stories podcast uh, that's why i brought them <laughs> yeah let's do it um so do a wide shot <laughs> so i i'm distraught and i'm expecting that the lord is going to tell me why i didn't obtain what it was that i was seeking and he said to me, um, you endeavored to believe that you should receive the blessing which was offered unto you. But behold, verily I say, there were fears in your heart, and verily this is the reason you did not receive. It goes on to say, again, I say unto you, it is your privilege and a promise I give unto you that have been ordained unto this ministry, that inasmuch as you strip yourselves from jealousies and fears and humble yourselves before me, for you are not sufficiently humble, the veil shall be rent, and you shall see me and know that I am. And that was that was clear to me. Um, and that was one of two occasions when that very thing was communicated to me, that you need to continue seeking me, and I will, I will manifest myself to you. Um, and so that was, that was me at the Air Force Academy. I then go to the temple. I'm endowed. That was beautiful to me. I didn't have any, it wasn't a, a scary thing to me. It was, I thought, this is the gospel I've been seeking for. I see the man Adam, who apparently is supposed to represent me, looking and looking for true messengers until angels come to him from heaven to instruct him. And then they prepare him to go converse with the Lord through the veil, and then he does it. He enters the Lord's presence. That was the gospel journey that I had come to discover for myself. Before and so <clears throat> that witness you received on that day yeah. was basically <clears throat> through that scripture you just read, the Lord saying, don't give up, humble yourself, keep purifying yourself, and the witness will come. That's right. And then that's, the how, temple, I, that's how I took it. And then the and temple further confirmed to me that, that the path that I was pursuing was, in fact, the gospel. That, that was, I thought, yeah, this makes perfect sense to me. I am following in the footsteps of the man Adam, and he took the path that I'm taking. That was my confirmation. Yeah, so this is, this is what, there's no Denver snuffer involved in any of this. This is me, Matt Lohmeyer. This is my, my journey. Um, this is what I've gleaned from reading Bruce McConkey and Joseph Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith and, and being taught by people who, who know better, uh, and I sought out the advice and instruction of those who knew, so who I thought knew. Yeah. So that that's this is me leading up to my mission. I, I'm then called uh, to serve in the Taiwan mission, um, which we can talk about if you want to get get to that. Whatever right now, you think so. is important about your yeah journey. Yeah. So there's three things I want to share from my mission uh, that are also important 
framework. Um, um, my, my father is still not a member of the church when I leave on my mission to go to Taipei, Taiwan, but he was supportive of me going. I didn't have the money to fund my mission experience, and so people from my home ward back in Tucson were willing to give the money to support my mission experience. Um, I was so concerned about praying in faith that my father would be baptized while I was on my mission because for some reason I thought my having chosen to serve a mission was going to influence my father to be baptized. Um, I, I, that I decided I was going to make it a matter of prayer and I was praying every day for my father to be baptized. And it was frankly quite distracting to the missionary work. I, I'm supposed to be focusing on these people um, who I've been called to serve and I'm focusing on my dad who's halfway around the world. And so we had a mission rule that you could only fast once a month on Fast Sunday, which is the first Sunday of the month. And I thought that's not, I need to somehow diver divert my daily prayers from my father to a weekly effort, which I will do in fasting and prayer. So within a couple of weeks of being on my mission, I went to the mission president's wife in the mission home. And I said, I explained to her that I'm completely distracted praying for my father. And I'd like to request your permission because she was apparently the one in charge of the fasting rules, rules in the mission. I'd like to request your permission to fast every week for the rest of my mission for my father. Um, and she was surprised and said, yeah, I give you permission to do that. And so every weekend I would start a fast and that was my time to, to focus on um, my dad. And, and the rest of the week I'd made the commitment I would focus on the people I was teaching. Um, and uh, before I left on my mission, my dad, all the, all the Air Force Academy cadets, there's about 30 of us who were leaving on a mission at the same time. All of us were called to foreign speaking missions. They like to send the Air Force guys, military guys to these different countries and have them learn foreign languages. And there was one of my friends who, when he was waiting for his mission call, said to his friends, guess where I'm going. We're going to have the game where everyone guesses. And he sent that to my parents as well, because my parents knew who he was. And my dad said, again, non-member, somewhat anti-Mormon, he says, I'm guessing you're going to come to Tucson, Arizona. Highly unlikely, by the way, because we all went foreign speaking. And he says, and if you do come to Tucson, Arizona, I will let you teach me the missionary discussions. What? <laughs> and so here I am thinking, that ain't happening. <laughs> but if it does, that would be amazing, right? Well, so he gets his mission call and he's called to Tucson, Arizona. No way! And I'm like, man, my dad is going to eat his words. And then my dad said, if you get assigned to my ward, the Tucson mission is a big mission. There's, I think, at least then there were five stakes. I don't know how many there are today. If you get assigned to my ward, I will let you teach me the missionary discussions. He was assigned to my dad's ward. And so my dad was kind of stuck at that point. And um, my, my siblings and my mother and me are all thinking this is the culmination of many prayers and fasts. And so, so while I'm on my mission, my friend is on his mission teaching my dad the missionary discussions. And, and it, it, it's a really good thing in many ways, but my dad doesn't get baptized at that time. And my friend comes home from his mission thinking the entire reason I left and came on a mission, it seems to me, is to teach Matt Lohmeyer's dad the gospel. <laughs> and he rejected it. Mm. He didn't get baptized. Uh, I nevertheless continued that fast throughout my mission and then continued um, after uh, my mission was over. And my dad ultimately was baptized into the LDS church. And he had some sweet experiences where he was converted um, with interactions with his stake presidency, with his reading of some passages in the Book of Mormon. And so um, my family felt like we had had our prayers answered in that regard. And so for a time, he and my mom both are attending church together as active members of the church. And that, that was for a time. Uh, that's the first thing I want to mention about my mission experience. The second thing was on December 23rd of 2003, I was in the mission home across the street from the Taiwan Temple. I was an assistant to the president at the time. And my companion from Idaho, Ray Widmer, and I, it was 12.30 at night. We were up preparing for a conference well after the hours where we were supposed to be in bed. We're preparing for um, a conference on the east coast of Taiwan, and my mission president was in his office. And we were on the fourth floor of a dalo, a building um, 
I think the temple president lived on the maybe the sixth and seventh floors and the mission president lived on the fifth floor with his family and we were in the mission office on the fourth floor. And there was a frantic buzzing of the doorbell at 12.30 in the morning on the 23rd of December. And instantly when, um, instantly when the doorbell rang, I had the impression that evil had come knocking at the door. And um, I knew that that's what we were going to encounter. And so I pushed the button and said, wait, saying hello in Chinese. Uh, and there was a woman screaming on the other end. And she said, we need the priesthood. And so my companion and I, these 20-year-old kids, you know, walk down or go down the elevator and the elevator doors open. And in the foyer, the opening of the building there um, that we were in, there's about a 10-foot gap of a foyer and then there's these glass doors. And outside the glass doors, we could see a woman who is clearly possessed with devils being restrained by a man with all of his might and a woman standing beside them um, who is apparently the woman who had called us asking for us to come down and help. And boy, that was terrifying. And the first thought that I have, I've never encountered this before, I picture pre Peter in the Temple Endowment video. And I think, well, I know what Peter did, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I open the glass doors and let this woman in. And I, I, I to shorten the story and to spare the listeners some details, I do what I see Peter do in the temple. And um, it was seemingly effective for about five seconds. And with all the rage and anger and hate that you could picture Satan having, uh, we were mocked and jeered and, and uh, verbally attacked by the voices of men coming out of this woman uh, in a way that was more terrifying than something I had experienced in my life up to that point. And the struggle ensued and lasted for about 45 minutes where um, we're attempting to cast out evil. My mission president comes down, and his first thought is, when he sees it, to do the exact same thing that I had just tried to do. And he is temporarily successful, and that doesn't last. And he, he, the resultant experience is, is he's jeered and mocked, and, and then the temple president ultimately comes down. The, the way that that ends up um, finishing is that there is a laying on of hands, there is the casting out of... Uh, the devils, a command for them to not return. And that is a successful endeavor. And we all kind of break up and go home for the evening. Um, at one point, and I'll, I'll mention this, uh, I'm sparing some, actually some details that I shouldn't say. At one point, we are successful about 20, 30 minutes into this and casting out these evil spirits. And she, she, with her spirit back into her, it was almost tangible. You could almost see her spirit come back into her body, but you couldn't see it. She walks back up to the glass doors, and she points across the street at the temple, and she says, they need my help. And instantly she was possessed. So there was something going on there um, where she had potentially invited this. The night is over, and we walk back home, and we lay in bed, and it's like the walls are crawling, and we can barely go to sleep. And... Um, my mission companion from Idaho says, I never knew that stuff was real. And he says, and if that was real, then there must surely be a God. It was this great revelation to him. And I'm thinking, you didn't know that stuff was real? Haven't you read your scriptures? You know, But none of us had experienced it. And, and at that point in my um, life, as a result of that experience, I was given a gift of discernment between light and darkness. And every time I shook someone's hand, every day of my mission after that, I'd look in their eyes and I'd shake their hand, and I would tell instantly whether or not they had the light of Christ was the guiding influence in their life or whether Satan was the guiding influence in their life. And I can't explain it, and I don't have the gift today, but I had it while I was on my mission. And um, I learned then that more Latter-day Saints were under the influence of the devil than were the Buddhist and heathen as you might call them, Taiwanese people on that island. And that was, just blew my mind because I would have never supposed that the Christian community at large or the Latter-day Saint community would be under that influence, but they were. And that these good Mus or Buddhist people or Tao Taoist people that I was teaching, not knowing anything about Christ, would be under his influence. And uh, so that was an important thing for me uh, to share. And um, it was an important fundamental 
change in my mindset as I approach the gospel going forward that I learned from that experience that night. And uh, uh, the last thing I'll share, uh, and then I'll turn the time over back over to you, I guess, because I've been going for some time. Um, to get into the Air Force Academy for the first time, I I was um, I, I was helped by basketball coaches. I didn't have the grades to get into the Air Force Academy, and so uh, the first time that I got in, it was with them pulling strings. And when I resigned to go on my mission. I had to reapply for a congressman's nomination and go through the whole process again, and I was denied acceptance into the Air Force Academy while I was on my mission. And I was on the street in Taipei telling my mission companion in English that I was probably going to go back and go to BYU. I'm not going to the Air Force because I wasn't, I, I didn't get back in the second time, and I feel a tap on my shoulder. And I turn around, there's a white guy standing there who's in a white shirt and tie, and he sticks out his hand and he says, Gentry Stevens, 94 grad. Do you want to get back into the Air Force Academy? This is on the streets in Taipei. There are no white people around. And you don't dare say no when someone offers you that. And so I said, yes, I do want to go back. And he gives me his business card. And we start talking. And he calls friends at the Pentagon and elsewhere. And I get back into school at the Air Force Academy. So I knew that that was the path I was supposed to go take. I was supposed to go to school there. And that's where I ended up going back to school. And then later meeting my wife, graduating from there. That's how I end up in the Air Force. So those were pivotal experiences on my mission that I felt like I wanted to Wait, he didn't know your backstory? I had no idea. I, he, he heard me talking to my companion on the street about not getting into the Air Force Academy, and I'd never met the guy before. And he had the and he, power to get me back into the Air Force. And he got you back in? He got me back in. Was he LDS? I don't think so. No. Huh. Not to my knowledge, and I've never seen the guy since. So, um, so by this point, really, you're a believer in miracles. I am a believer in miracles, and that was one of them. That yeah. was one of them. Yeah, yeah. So I was supposed to be at least temporarily in the Air Force, and uh, and there's reasons why that that was my path. Okay, so, so you come home. How do you meet a McConkie? Yeah, so a singles ward. I was uh, a junior at the Air Force Academy. Um, I walked into the chapel, and Sarah had and been... And that, that takes you to Colorado Springs. That's, where, that's where I'm at. Yeah, the Air Force Academy is just outside of Colorado Springs, and I was attending a singles ward in Colorado Springs. And I met Sarah uh, one Sunday in church as she was walking down from the, um, the up, up near the front of the chapel. She had just got done playing the violin, I think, in a previous ward, and I was coming in from my ward. And she was a senior in high school, so I'd never seen her there before. She had just come to play a musical number. And what was Mark, and her dad, doing in Colorado Springs? He, he was a professor. He... he he taught at Colorado at, State University at UCCS, uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Oh, Colorado State's at Fort Collins. Yeah, it's up okay. further north. Okay. okay. So I meet Sarah that day. Uh, she was she was born and raised in Colorado Springs. We cross paths, and I stop her, and I thought she was beautiful, and I stop her and wanted to get to know her, and I knew that I hadn't seen her there before, and there was a chance if I didn't stop her that day, I wasn't going to get to see her again, and I asked her on a date. You were how old? So I was just returned from my mission, probably 22 years old, 21 or 22 years old. And, and she, she was, was a senior in high school. she was 17 or 18? She was, uh, we'll say 18. Okay. Because <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, so, yeah, senior, senior in high school. And I said, uh, I'd like to take you on a date. And, and she says, well, I'm leaving for BYU in two days. And I said, how about tomorrow night? <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, by the way, you'll have to pick me up because I don't have a car. I just came back <laughs> off my mission and, and you can't get a car at the Air Force Academy until you're a junior. So she drives up to the Air Force Academy, and we go on our first date and have a pizza together. And neither of us was very hungry that night. But uh, then she went off to BYU, and we dated long distance for a really long time. Did you get the sense that she was... Uh, did you know... Okay, so she told you her last name. She did. What did that mean to you at the time? So this was kind of fun, and Sarah and I discovered this last week um, as we were reading through... Um, we were reading through some old things. We read through Bruce McConkie's biography that was written by his son, Joseph Fielding. And I have a note in that book. And it had a date, because when I finish a book, I'll always put a note in there about my thoughts about the book. And I said something like, terrific book, I love the man, uh, dated whatever. And it was a week before I met Sarah. And so with that on my heart and mind, the fact that I, I loved so much this man, Bruce McConkie, it, it was 
it was all the more compelling to me that this is a good person who I'm interested in getting to know. Did she convey a sense of righteousness that maybe the average Mormon girl didn't, in your view? Did, was she, there McConkey goodness that rubbed off on her? There is a McConkey goodness that, 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 that she um, had. And there is a McConkey goodness, to be clear. What is that? Can you describe that? that? You meet a lot of people in the LDS church and out of the LDS church, and I've met, you meet a lot of people. And the McConkeys are genuinely salt of the earth people. And in fact, you, you hit on it in your opening remarks about Mark Jr., who's up in Logan. Um, wonderful. I couldn't agree more with uh, your assessment. And so when I meet Sarah and shake her hand, uh, my I am recently home from my mission. I've still got this gift of discernment, but it's starting to fade. And this is a good person. Why would uh, God take away your gift of discernment that um, he gave you on your mission? It's a great question. I think there's something to be said about um, proximity to certain experiences. Um, I think there's a reason why Moroni visits so often with Joseph Smith. I think there's a reason why he encounters Satan. I think that, that there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a potency to the um, in, pro in proximity to experience that, um, that the further away you get from certain pointed experiences, uh, men are weak, everything in this world atrophies. I think that the gift I was given was in direct relation to having had the experience with darkness. I'm looking into the eyes of a person who has no soul. Right now? No, not right oh, now. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> Just checking. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, on December 23rd, the, the that woman, night, the woman who was possessed. I'm looking into the eyes of someone, and I've never seen anything like it. That experience then translates to me being able to look into people's eyes, and everyone's got light. Every human who's here that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, as you shake hands with people, you look into their eyes, there is a light, even if they're not good people. There is a light that is in people's um, eyes. So I, I don't know that God took away the gift. It's simply a, a function of me being immortal here and not having had any similar experiences as the years go on. And I think it faded. Okay. Yeah. But with her, you, you felt it. No, yeah, she, she's wonderful. And anyone who would meet her today would say the same thing. She's a wonderful person. Okay, so she yeah. goes to BYU. She does. You stay. You guys date. We that date. must have been hard for you to have this girl. Did you know? Did you know you loved her from the start or not? Very close. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, she she was. Um, what a terrible thing to do to a new freshman girl at BYU is to date her long distance. Yeah. I felt bad actually in retrospect. Not while I was dating her, I didn't feel bad, but I felt bad <laughs> after. I thought, I thought, how do you do that to someone? You basically ask of her her devotion, and I saw her once a month, and she's being faithful, uh, as far as I know, to me in our relationship, and her heart is tied up with me, and she, and we're seeing each other once a month, and she's at BYU, I'm at the Air Force Academy. You can't get married while you're a cadet at the Air Force Academy. So we we uh, we dated for nine months. Uh, we broke up. We have kind of separate paths for a little bit. We date other people. For six years, we're apart. And what? We're, and while I'm at an Air, while I'm at an Air Force years. base, six years. She never got married? She was close, and I was close. I was engaged to be married to someone else. We stayed in contact. Um, so this is long, long story, very short. But we, we stay in contact. In fact, I'd come to... She's living in New York City at times. She's living in D.C. doing work out there. This is post-graduation from BYU. Um, and I'm stationed in the Air Force in Tucson and then in Oklahoma. And I would come, for instance, to a 4th of July parade in Provo. And I'd run into Sarah McConkie. Okay, why didn't you just and, marry her the day you graduated from the Air Force Academy? Well, we weren't what? dating the day I married why her. Why not? Uh, that was my fault. I'll, I'll, I'll publicly admit. Uh, to, <laughs> you were and, slow. And, I was slow. I was very slow. And, um, and in fact, in retrospect, and Sarah and I both agree to this, and I'll speak for myself here, that was an important six years for me. That, that time period where I wasn't married and dedicated a lot of my time to digging deeper into Mormon history. That was an important time in my life where um, I needed to develop and actually had some worldview changes yet again that were important for me to have before I decided who I was going to Did marry. you kind of stray from the gospel a little bit? No. 
You no, were. I was very active in the church. Those very, six years. The whole time. Yep. But you got. But, but my views were changing and developing. Okay. Um, in fact, um, I've got a few notes here. I want to make sure there's a couple things I, I get to hit on um, before we finish this segment. Okay. We need to talk about Adam God. Adam God theory doctrine. We how does it fit into that. your? How does it fit into your narrative? Yeah, this is a, it's important. We need to talk about that. We need to talk about me being a temple worker in Oklahoma City before marrying Sarah. Um, yeah, the, the, the Adam God thing certainly that was a dilemma I was encountering before Let's marriage. Let's do it now. Um, so, and this ties in. You, you're asking about that. So there were six years before we get married. Um, that older couple in my ward in Tucson who I was going to to ask gospel questions. A few times while I was in their house, they said something like, Brigham Young said some interesting things about Adam. And like that made me shiver in my boots because I thought interesting means probably I don't want to dabble in that and I don't want to look into it. And that was me in high school. I get to the Air Force Academy and there, and there were a couple of occasions where I had opportunities to chat with them. And I was asking them questions about the gospel. I was asking them questions about Brigham Young and some different things I was encountering. And they said to me, kind of looking at one another, he said some interesting things about Adam. They were never willing to press something onto me. They were very careful. And they figured if you want to go look into that, you can go look into that. And I thought, I'm going to go look into that. And so I start looking. First place I thought to look was the discourses of Brigham Young. There's not much in there. I mean, it's very carefully crafted, compiled. But I look in there and I'm seeing a few things and I think, you know, there's nothing really very interesting about Adam in here. So I start looking elsewhere and I start Googling things. And what I encounter seems to me to be the work of anti-Mormons. And therefore I shut it up and I stop investigating. I come back from my mission and something in me decides I'm going to look into that issue, whatever it is, and I'm going to confront it head on until I get to the bottom of it. And so after my mission, while I'm, I think, still a student at the Air Force Academy, I, I've acquired enough of a library. I've got all the Journal of Discourses. I've got, all, I've, got, I've got enough stuff to start really looking into this. And I start to dig into to what Brigham Young has taught about Adam, and I'm actually quite surprised and it seemed to me that he was teaching that Adam was Heavenly Father. And that Heavenly Father came down to the earth and became the man Adam. And I thought, surely I'm misunderstanding this. And so I keep reading, and I keep reading, and I find fundamentalist Mormons books. And if any people was candid about their understandings of early Mormon history, it was the fundamentalist Mormon authors. Like Ogden Kraut? Or who? Ogden Kraut. Um, um, Cully Christensen. David Dye is a... Uh, an author uh, who's compiled some things about early Mormon history. Uh, Drew Briney uh, has put together a book called Adam God Teachings, I think. Um, and I read it all. I read everything I could get my hands on about this thing. At the same time, I'm reading what Bruce McConkie said uh, about Brigham Young's teachings. I read a letter that he writes to Eugene England in which he brings up the topic I read what Spencer W. Kimball says about it. I read what Joseph Fielding Smith says about it. And I'm spending uh, literally months looking at all of this. And um, I told you already how I, how I viewed Bruce McConkie and Joseph Fielding Smith. These were heroes of mine in Mormonism who I looked to as prophets and apostles. And, and I respected their words very much. I looked at Brigham Young as a prophet at this time in my life. And the two of them were saying things that were incompatible with one another. That was really hard for me. This is, if I had anything like a faith crisis, this was the moment in my life. It didn't mean I was having a faith crisis with the church at that time or the gospel. My faith crisis was in that, who do I trust? This guy or this guy? In 1852, Brigham Young gave a sermon from the pulpit in general conference in which he said, I'm going to reveal something to you about Adam about his position before he came here and who he is. And if you don't believe it, you will be damned. I've got it in volume one of the Journal of Discourses, and I've got it all marked up. Hmm. I read his letter, to Bruce McConkie's letter to Eugene England, in which he says, if you choose to believe what Brigham Young taught about Adam, you will be damned. <laughs> that's a big problem. <laughs> that's pretty much a direct conflict. You had and, to I, choose. And, I, and I thought, if I choose to believe this prophet, I'm damned. And if I choose to believe this prophet, I'm damned. 
That's un it's unacceptable. Um, and boy, for weeks and weeks, I really wrestled with this because I had to trust one of them. But if I didn't trust the other one, I was rejecting one of the prophets. You know, this is such a, it was a silly dilemma. But when you're so entrenched in a Mormon tradition that tells you you have to trust the brethren and that they can't lead you astray, when that's the doctrine, this is a really big problem. And so finally, I, I, I make it a matter of prayer. I ask God how to sort this out. And very clearly, he communicated to me, stop worrying about what those men say. And that was surprising because I'm supposed to worry about what these men say. And he instructed me. Meaning to, Bruce and Brigham. Bruce and Brigham. Both. Stop worrying about what they're saying. This isn't. Your salvation has nothing to do with what they're saying about this thing. Hmm. Okay. That was really helpful to me. Interesting. And it, it changed my worldview. That was a moment in time, and that's why I need to bring this up, where for the first time in my life, as a student at the Air Force Academy, I realized that what Bruce or what Brigham or anyone else who I respected, for sure, was saying about any particular thing, it didn't have any bearing upon my salvation. What did was my relationship with Christ. And in fact, I was able to go to God, he informed me, God informed me, <laughs> and find out answers to my prayers. I didn't have to rely upon them. And so I did that. And I, I prayed and I prayed and I searched more and I kept reviewing these things until I felt like I understood the topic very well. And it was somewhat true what Bruce McConkie was saying and it was somewhat true what Brigham Young was saying. But, but I also learned in that process that I think Brigham Young and that thing had learned some things from Joseph Smith and he had misunderstood them and he and Heber C. Kimball and a few others came up with an Adam-God doctrine that was somewhat tied to what Joseph was teaching about Adam, but wasn't a completely accurate representation of what Joseph had taught about Adam. And I still believe that's true. So learning that for me was huge. Learning that I didn't need to trust him or him or him, who was a leader of the church, to get an answer, that was huge. Changed my life. It kind of explains the letter you end up writing to your stick president. <laughs> it explains how I'm in a position to to then, and if you read the letter, um, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, share we'll, it we'll get to we'll, the, we'll, we'll get to that. Too, but. but but boy, that I had no problem speaking out against the idea that trust us, we can't lead you astray. Utterly false. Yeah. Utterly false. And anyone who studied Mormon history can't possibly accept that as a tenet of their gospel that they believe in. So, so um, there was that, and then temple, temple work. All right. I cringe bringing up the story that I'm going to share, but I need to share it. Um, and I think my wife might cringe at home. And uh, so I apologize to anyone who is very active Latter-day Saint who would cringe at what I'm going to share, but it's important. As I mentioned, I'm continually seeking the experience of coming into the Lord's presence. I've learned in a temple at this point in my life that there are certain ways to pray. And I've also learned from the church that I'm not allowed to pray that way. That's a big problem too. And I've also learned from the Adam-God dilemma that I had encountered that I don't know if it matters that much what these men are telling me to do. And I'm just going to tell you, yeah, he, I, you're speaking respectfully. What I heard you say is, you learned about the true order of prayer at the temple. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. I'm, yeah. I, I just I'm, want to make sure I understand you. what you're saying. I, is I that learned right? that there is a true order of prayer, and to me that means I need to pray that way. And oh, by the way, if you'll recall what it says in the temple, you're instructed to pray that way. And then I go back into the church, and the church says, "Hey, you can't pray that way. Uh, there's only the old people that work in the temple who officiate the ceremonies. They're the only ones that can pray that way. And by the way, they're only allowed to pray about these three or four things." And for me, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with God. I remember the experience I have at the Air Force Academy where I'm climbing a mountain and I'm getting close and I'm, I have jealousies and pride that I need to overcome and I need to humble myself. But I'm thinking I need to do everything within my power to show the Lord that I'm employing all of the knowledge that he's given me in order to pierce the veil. And as I see Adam do it, there are certain things he learns that he presents to God at a veil that I need, I need to follow that path. And so I am so determined to somehow figure out a way to do this that I go and I talk to my stake president and I say, I need to become a temple worker. Because it, in my mind at that time, the only way 
I can have the experience of, of being obedient to what I've learned is if I'm the guy at the altar praying. And so I say I need to become a temple worker. Why? Well, because it's important to me. and I need to. You know, so I, he says, okay, I'll recommend you. I go become a temple worker. I become a full ordinance worker. At what age? And this is me. Uh, I'm an instructor pilot in Oklahoma for the Air Force at the time, and I'm probably 24 or 5 years old. And um, during and this I, time, and, you learned to fly F-15s, and now you're so, so not people. yet. I was okay. a, I was a T-38 instructor pilot. Um, I had just finished student pilot training. It was the fighter trainer, and they kept me there as an instructor pilot for three years, so I could teach the new students. And it was after that that I go fly F-15s. Okay. And so. Um, and I'll, and I'll add here, because it's worth adding, the, the, the title of this interview, I think, has Denver Snuffer's name in it. I'd never heard of Denver Snuffer. I'd never read anything he'd written. And frankly, at this point in my life, I think maybe he was just starting to write the book, The Second Comforter or something, but I, I'd not heard of it. So I, I find myself in the temple being instructed by some of the older men who are my trainers, the things I'm allowed to pray for at the altar. And you're allowed to pray for President Hinckley or Monson at the time. It was probably Monson. I can't remember. It was about the time there was a transition there. What You're year? allowed to pray for the president of the church. Around what year? This is probably 2008 or nine. So President Monson's the president of the church. Um, you're allowed to pray for him. You're allowed to pray for the names of the people who are whose, whose names are upon the altar. You're allowed to pray for the missionaries and maybe the youth of the church. Beyond that, don't say anything. People's arms will get tired. They're they're old and they have to repeat what you say. And you keep it simple. And I said, yeah, yeah, copy. And I thought, well, there's a couple other things I'm going to pray for, too. <laughs> You're a righteous rebel by this a point. righteous rebel. <laughs> but as you, the, the reason it was important for me to share some of the background is because you have to understand the path I've been on t- for this to make any sense. So I find myself in the temple. I go to officiate at the altar in a temple. And I get to be the voice in the prayer, and I pray for the things that they've instructed me to pray for, and I also pray for a few other things, like coming to know the Lord in the flesh, and that kind of thing, because it matters so much that I get to utter those words while praying in a certain manner. Now, you were praying for yourself to come to know the Lord in the no, flesh? No, I was careful. I'm more discreet than that, and I prayed in a way that I thought would be agreeable to the company. And it was. And I, th- and I had people come up to me afterward and said, I've never heard anyone pray for some of these things <laughs> in the temple. And that meant a lot to me. Thank you. And I thought, yeah, that's right. We need to be praying for some things, right? <laughs> and so I'm able to have the experience. Um, and, um, and because I had done that, and because I was still dissatisfied with, um, with my ability to freely express my, the feelings of my heart to God in that manner, I had a decision to make. And the decision was, can I pray this way in my home? And, and I knew what the church's answer was. The church's answer is absolutely not. Uh, and at this point, I live by myself. I have yeah, a bachelor pad, right? Right. <laughs> How and, do you do the true prayer by yourself? And I'll tell you, I'd read enough Mormon history to understand that they were building altars in their homes. Uh, and there were instructions. Who was? So in the early days of the church throughout the 19th century, um, there were instructions at the stake level for how to make your own garments, how to build an altar in your home, and how to how to how how wide it needed to be, how tall it needed to be. I have never heard about people building altars. But so so Mormon homes would have um, they'd have a sacred place set aside that they would have an altar in their home where they would don the robes of the priesthood and they would offer up signs and they would pray. Meaning the temple clothing? That's right. In their homes? In their homes. With altars? You read now Is now, this Ogden Kraut stuff or is this No no, this is this is this is well documented. Wilford Woodruff's journals. He in fact, I can't remember if it was Wilford Woodruff or Heber C. Kimball, but it's one of the two of them said every time we gathered together to pray and donned the robes of the holy priesthood and offered up the signs of the holy priesthood, and this is in his journal. Anyone can go buy this and read this. We were answered by God. Oh my gosh. Well, that means something to me because I want to be answered by God. And so I thought, I'm not going to build an altar in my home. I don't, that, that was, that was for me even, that was uncomfortable. And, um, but I thought I've, I've, I've got to somehow be able to do what I've been instructed by the Lord in the temple to do, which is pray unto him in a certain manner. And so I sat wrestling with 
the potential of of dressing in my temple robes. And this is the part that makes me cringe. I mean, this is. Um, so I apologize to those who are listening for the, the, this, uh, particularly my family members for whom this might be uncomfortable. But people, people are loving it. We have two hundred and thirty people good, good. signed in. That's a big number. Krista writes, "This is so great, Matthew. Thank you for sharing about the true order of prayer." So. People are enjoying I'm not it. sharing too much about it, but I'll tell you, I'm not advocating that anyone do what I did. Let me just tell you my story, though. So what I do is I, I ask, I tell God, I am going to don the robes in my home. I am going to pray in the manner that I've been instructed and in which I've only ever done in a temple. And if I am doing something that is not pleasing to you, I hope you'll tell me. And I understand that I run the risk of getting into trouble if anyone in the church knew that I was doing this, but it doesn't matter to me what they say. I had already come to a point where don't trust in the men, come to me. And and so I did it. And I and it was boy, that was a frightful moment. This is me, rebel righteous rebel me. I am fully active in the LDS church. I'm willing to sustain the brethren from the lowest to the greatest. But it doesn't matter to me if they tell me I can't do this, because in my temple covenants, God has told me to do it. And I'm willing to do it. So I do it and the fruit were good. Okay, wait. And so I'm not How do you <laughs> how do you pray alone in the true order of prayer? Because I think of in a circle and everybody's putting their elbow on the person next to them. Yeah, without without getting into the 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 details of how I did what, that took some deliberate consideration about how it is. And I'll tell you what helped me was reading early Mormon history and finding out how they went about things. There were different circumstances in which they, so. So you had to kind of figure it out. Yeah, and, and there's those those the signs and tokens and etc. that we learn that we covenant not to disclose. There are, there's more meaning to those in symbolism to me than than just the action of doing certain things with your body, body language, making signs. There was actually symbolism involved there that indicated to God your preparedness to approach him at the veil. And so without talking about that, I understood what I needed to accomplish in order to approach the Lord in that way. And then to the best of my ability, I replicated what I saw in the temple as an individual without having other people around me. And um, so for what it's worth, that's what I'm willing to say about it. And and you said I, the results were good. The result was good. And and what I'll say about that was that I had a witness that my actions were pleasing to God. Not because, and this is my conviction, not because I had offered any signs, not because I had said certain key words, but because he knew in my heart I was willing so much to humble myself and disregard what men said and to do everything that I understood was within my power to approach God. And that was pleasing to him. And I had a witness, not that I needed to continue to do that, but that my efforts were pleasing. And if I pursue that path, I will be successful. Right now I can see you tearing up a little bit. Yeah. Can you talk about what emotions you're feeling and why? Um, I'll say that um, it hasn't ever stopped, but from the time in 19, from the time in between my junior and senior year when I asked God about Joseph and get a clear answer to today, I've, there are ups and downs in everyone's life and you have moments when you feel closer to God and moments when you feel like he's distant. I have not had a break in um, communication with him where I don't feel like he's not willing to answer my prayers. It might take months, and it might take years, depending on what the issue was. But the reason I got emotional is because that was one more data point in my journey where I felt like the Lord was smiling down upon me and saying, continue what you're doing. Yeah. And so nothing happened. But I'll, I'll say, I mean, I didn't, I didn't pierce the veil in the day in which I decide I'm going to don temple robes in my house. But what happened was one more assurance that God is pleased with those who seek to live by the knowledge that they've been given. And so that was important for me too. So um, I, I guess th those are the things that as a, as a basis, as a foundation, I feel are important for me to share about my personal journey before I get to a point where I discover this guy named Denver Snuffer. 
so that that kind of I don't know if you have any questions about any of the things that I've shared up to this point, but I think that kind of takes us up to uh, and and I'll mention. So Sarah and I are married. Um, Did you yeah. tell her, <laughs> Sarah? I practice the True Order prayer in my temple clothes alone. <laughs> No, sometimes no, there's <laughs> and then did you feel like yeah, you were was... withholding things from her and not being fully honest was there a dilemma there sure great question um I, I don't have any recollection of having you know when we start dating again for the first time hey let me tell you what i've been up to for the last six years in my private life um but we always have had from day one when we met we've always had and throughout our dating years a very open dialogue about our beliefs um she knew well back then when we first started dating while we were students in college that i was on a path of seeking for these things and um i think that surprised her a little bit and but i think it was something she welcomed and she was supportive of it and um she was believing and um and so we were i was very open with her and sharing personal experiences that i'd had when we started dating again six years later, I was still very open with her, and at that time, I was reading Denver stuff. And I was open with her, and I shared with her, hey, I am reading this guy's stuff, it's very good. Before you Before, started dating her the second time? Yeah, while when we started dating the second time, um, I, I shared with her some of the things that I was reading. And she um, was leery. He was a member in good standing at that point but I think the topic about which he was writing you have this cover of a book and the young girl looking up and the second comforter conversing with the Lord through the veil temple language are you supposed to say that that's temple language I think that makes people leery and so I think she was cautious uh, she didn't start reading his his books in fact until after we were married uh, several months later okay yeah. So, you discovered Denver Snuffer's writings and teachings prior to marrying Sarah. I did. 